Chemical Engineering College, Sipu. She will she will talk on <coughs> cyber security and associated risk management. And uh, we will uh, learn a lot of things regarding the security and cyber security and all those things from her. So with uh, with your due permission, uh, I try. Uh, I am requesting you to start the proceeding and lecture. Please, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with a, a note of thanks to Professor Pal. Um, thank you, Professor Pal, for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to interact with the audience. Uh, and very good morning to all of you who are present here. So uh, I shall move uh, straight away to my uh, talk because um, I have joined a few minutes late, I guess. So I apologize for that. Due to certain network issues, I was not being able to set up my uh, internet connection. Uh, so it's uh, good to go now. <clears throat> so um, the topic that he has uh, given me is uh, cyber security and associated risk management. So given, uh, uh, given the fact that this uh, uh, particular uh, webinar it includes um, audiences from various different domains. The plan is that I shall start with a very basic of cyber security, what it is all about. And then uh, I shall move on to few specific problem domains which we are working with and which are uh, extremely relevant, uh, whether you are working in anything related to electronics, electrical, or uh, metallurgy, material science, or computer science information technology. These problems hold relevance in almost all the fields of engineering today. So I shall focus on few of such problems, especially related to forensics, where we work on, we are currently working on. So let me get started with the talk. Uh, Dr. Paul, should I start then? Please, please, please start. OK, OK. Thank you, sir. So what I shall do is I shall uh, share my screen now and I shall keep my uh, camera off to save bandwidth. <clears throat> OK, thank you. Please. Thank you. is getting shared just a moment can you all see the screen yes yes okay thank you It's taking some time to be shared. I have shared only this uh, window. I have not shared my entire screen. Uh, so, uh, Professor Ruchira, if you hi. can share full. Uh, entire screen will be fine. Better. Okay. Otherwise, it will okay, be okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just like Google Meet, I guess. OK.
Is this visible now? Yes, yes, it is visible. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. So this is the topic and um, as Professor Paul has already introduced me, uh, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Information Technology at IIEST Shippur. This is located in West Bengal, India. And if you want, you can contact me here on this email ID. <clears throat> so the contents, uh, the plan of the entire talk is basically, I shall start with an overview of security as a whole. Then I, because I work in digital forensics related to risk management, so I shall introduce the audience to digital forensics. Then I shall talk about certain specific problems, four problems basically, which are extremely relevant and extremely uh, hot given uh, that a lot of people are working on these problems in the uh, present day. Uh, and counter forensics we shall see what it is these are basically attacks which um, attackers deliver to um, just um, negate out the effects of the forensic techniques to address these four problems and then i shall conclude my talk so basically to start with when we say that my system is secure my machine is secure or my, my application, the application has been made secure. What exactly do we mean? How to define security? Three features or three goals which completely define security, which are uh, in themselves complete to define security are confidentiality, integrity and availability. So we say CIA, right? So if I assist, when I say that my system is secure, I actually mean my system is confidential, integrity preserving and available. So next thing is to understand what these are, what these goals mean actually. So first goal of security is confidentiality. All three now, when I say first, second and third, there is no particular reason or no logic to rank them in this order. So uh, all, all these three are equally important. There is no higher weightage to any one of them as compared to the others. So uh, arbitrarily, let us say the first goal is confidentiality. What exactly do we mean by confidentiality? I think that this is pretty uh, easy to guess. When you are writing an email and you are sending it to your colleague, the email finally, as a uh, stream of bits, it is finally being transmitted over a insecure channel, such as the internet. Anybody, any outsider who does not have access to your email account or your colleagues, the rece intended recipient's email account, can see what transmission is going on over the channel, the communication channel, which is open for all. If you use any tool such as uh, Ethereal or Wireshark, you can simply find out what packets are being transmitted. And that would give you an idea, a very clear idea, the complete 100% knowledge about what message is being transmitted. Does that happen? No. That does not happen because Gmail has its own security algorithms running. And what is that? They are algorithms to preserve confidentiality. What exactly 
I mean by this is that when the email you write and you send before being transmitted, released to the uh, communication channel, it gets encrypted. To preserve confidentiality, that means the tool is encryption. The tool is encryption. To preserve confidentiality, what we do is we encrypt the message. And encryption means converting a plain text message into a cipher text format. Right. So how does it help me to uh, attain confidentiality? So that the outsiders, any Ill illegitimate person, those who are not the authorized parties, they don't have access. Actually, the meaning is they have access, but they do, cannot find out, cannot make the meaning, cannot uh, have any idea about what are the contents of the message. So it is basically converting your plain text message into a form of secret code. And this secret code generation, of course, involves a key, a parameter which these two parties, the sender and the receiver, they have knowledge about, nobody else. So they possibly have come together uh, at some point of time or through a reliable courier service, they have exchanged a key and they use this key to just lock the message. Once the message is locked, it can only be opened through the key which your intended receiver holds. So that is basically encryption and encryption helps you to attain confidentiality, the best, the first goal of security, right? And there are a lot of algorithms for encrypting a message, such as DES, Data Encryption Standard, AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, RSA, it is based, it, it is named um, on the name of the three scientists who had invented this technique, Rivest, Rivest Shamir and Edelman. Right. So I think uh, most of you know about all these um, encryption techniques which are prevalent and uh, popular in today's date. So the first goal of security is confidentiality. And the answer how you would attain confidentiality is, encrypt is through encryption. And of course, whenever you are encrypting a message, while reading the message, the recipient has to decrypt it. So I would write encryption plus decryption. The second goal of security is integrity. So here what happens is suppose anybody who has read the message, um, you have written the email and somebody, some third party has read it. That is one vulnerability which we have addressed here. The second vulnerability is suppose you are sending this message to convey some uh, information to your friend or your colleague. So uh, you have encrypted it. Now some outsider cannot read it, right? Without access to the key, uh, he cannot read it. He or she can't read it. That is fine. But the second vulnerability is what if the encrypted message is somehow modified or altered or tampered? The receiver would never know. Right, the receiver would use the key and the tampered encoded message only the receiver would open and read. Again, this is not desirable. This is a risk against integrity property of the message. Right, so we need some schemes, we need some techniques, foolproof techniques to preserve integrity. What we do is we cannot help to preserve, but at least what we can do is we can detect. So idea is to detect any kind of violation against integrity. For this, the techniques that we might adopt are some kind of mes message hash or message digest. It's kind of a fingerprint. The receive, sorry, the sender would generate this fingerprint just as uh, your fingerprint works. It's kind of a unique identifier for the person. On similar lines, uh, message digest or a message hash, it works as a 
fingerprint unique identifier of the message so this fingerprint is transmitted over a secure channel along with the message which is big in length right so it's a fingerprint for the, the human being is big whereas the fingerprint is very small so if we speak in terms of storage it will take much lesser amount of storage right so the same holds here the same features hold here as well you have a very big message which you are transmitting the digest of the message is much more smaller so we use a costly secure channel to exchange this message digest the sender would send a message the entire big large chunk of message over the insecure channel that is let us say the internet or the lan whatever you are using and then along with that over a secure channel the person would also send the digest of the message at the receiver end the message will be read and the digest will also be opened if the digest of the received message and the one which has been sent by the receiver they match if these match then we know that the integrity is preserved and we accept the message the receiver would accept your message but if there is a mismatch then simply it would mean there has been a violation of integrity and the message would be rejected correctly so the goal now is that if the message integrity is preserved you would accept the message if it is violated you would reject the message at least that much we have achieved now you cannot prevent anybody to modify the message um, incorrectly but what you can do is you can ensure that if somebody incorrectly modifies the message with some malicious intention then i can detect it and if the attacker knows that well the receiver can detect my malicious modifications then the attacker would no more go for attacking your system that is modifying your system maliciously that is the whole idea also watermarks are there about watermarking techniques i don't know how many of you know but these are a very popular techniques to for copyright uh, preservation copyright and rights preservation right digital rights preservation so watermarks are also many times used to see whether the message integrity is preserved or not all these belong to a class of fingerprint of the messages which act as unique identifiers much shorter in length and many times fixed in length the third goal of security is availability so here in the first and second goals what we have spoken about are uh, violations or risks which in involve some kind of um, external third parties to attack your system so we want both these goals target to make your system secure against external attacks but at the same time it is equally important that your system is available to the legitimate users ones who are authorized the system should be available to them always whenever they want so if it is risky if it is undesired to have somebody external modifying your data or your um, message which you are exchanging or stuff that you have stored on your hard disk somebody is coming who is not authorized and modifying those data or having a look at those data reading out those messages if that is undesirable then equally undesirable is the fact that you are the legitimate user and one day you go to your office and you are not able to access your hard disk or you are not able to access your email account that is equally risky the risks are equal so availability is the third goal of security to define availability it basically says to have the system available or accessible to the legitimate users always whenever they want it right so this basically involve uh, access rights preservation 
So, for example, uh, let us say this service is there. Let us say Gmail. Uh, there is a server, and you access this. Uh, all of us use their service. Almost all of us use their service. So this server should be available to serve you 24 into 7. Now one day, what happens is a person comes, an attacker, an outsider comes and sends thousands of bogus requests to the server. What will happen? It is, of course, it would have a threshold uh, of uh, throughput, right? So thousands of bogus requests, it goes to serve and in the process, it is not able to serve the legitimate users. That again is undesirable. And this is the third goal of security called availability. So this basic and this has never happened for Gmail server as far as we can remember, right? Why? Because their access right algorithms are uh, extremely powerful and effective. So what's happening is that uh, possibly they will detect the IP from where these messages have been sent. And if it, it, if, if it finds out that uh, more than maybe 100 messages within a uh, few seconds have been received from this IP address, so it will block it. Something like that, just to give you an idea, because we don't exactly in this, this uh, information is not open. So we don't know what algorithms they are implementing. But this is how um, availability uh, people would go for to achieve. Right. So the service to be available to legitimate users all of the time, whenever they would demand, is the third goal of security. So these are the three goals of security, CIA, as I said which completely define the term security. So I hope that now we all know that when I say my system is secure, what exactly we mean? We mean that the system is confidential. We mean that the system is integrity preserving and available to legitimate users all of the time, right? So I can share my slides with you all if you want. I, what I said, what we discussed till now are there on the slides as well. So you can go through this. <clears throat> as I said, threats to confidentiality are attacks such as snooping. Snooping means what? The communication channel or the wire is being tapped by some external party. So it is basically snooping. It, it is not going to harm your message in the sense that uh, modifying it. No, it won't, it, it won't modify your message, what you are transmitting. But passively, it would sit, the attacker would sit and just have a look at what is being transmitted. Snooping attack, traffic analysis attack, right? Even if you have encrypted, the outsider might go for um, tapping your channel and finding out certain statistics. Like, say, this kind of a pattern is being trans this kind of a pattern of message is being transmitted every day during this period of a time between these two IP addresses or these two hosts, right? That is also uh, something which you would not want, right? So all these are threats against confidentiality. Next is threats to integrity, modification, what we have already discussed, some part of the message, let us say a message is being transmitted and maybe the fourth block of the message contains, it, it is a message which your accountant or which your employer is sending to your accountant so that this much amount should be credited to your salary account at the end of this particular month. So maybe the fourth block of the message, it contains the salary statistics, salary information, the amount which is to be credited. And that one is simply modified, right? It's a form of modification attack against integrity, which we do not want again. The second form of attack against integrity, that is the masquerading attack. Masquerading is nothing but mm, acting as somebody else. So when your credit card gets stolen or your debit card gets stolen, uh, if somebody is able to 
succeeds to guess your pin number what's happening using it at uh, the stores or the atm machines what and just using your money so what is he doing basically this attacker acting as yourself right so that is a form of masquerading attack and this is a threat to integrity that means while preserving integrity we need to detect whether the message is being modified also we need to detect whether the source is authentic the instruction that deduct so much amount from so and so savings account is a form of masquerading attack it's an attack against integrity that means the instruction is coming from a source which is not authentic therefore nowadays they would add a otp uh, system etc uh, so people are gradually making the system more and more strong as uh, the attackers are getting the attacks are getting more and more strong right so this is second uh, form of attack against integrity masquerading or spoofing attack spoofing many times we call it that means a person acting as somebody else replay attack all of you of course must have seen must have used the otp service one time pad or one time uh, number that comes to your mobile phone or one time pin many times you call it so it's otp right and you see that otp is valid for um maybe 30 seconds or 10 seconds right why is that why is that layer of security added that is because uh you are doing a transaction and you are basically sending a message to your bank that pay so and so amount to this particular vendor now somebody else might just captured that message that you had sent out and later on the vendor might have captured your message and later on acting as you will again send the message to your bank and the bank will believe that you are again instructing the bank to pay so much amount to the vendor you don't want it that is why the banks what they have enforced is that they will send you a otp which is valid only for 10 seconds and after 10 second if that message is again sent the same instruction is given to the bank along with that old otp they will simply cancel the transaction because the otp has become invalid now think about it if the otp's additional layer was not there then what would have happened the same message would have been replayed to extract your money from your account and to pay that same vendor again and again just to prevent it this is a form of replay attack just to prevent it to prevent this kind of a replay attack the otp security layer has been added and there are many um, techniques but most of them basically are based on this kind of a time stamp the time stamp at which uh, the user the uh, had given the instruction after that maybe after 10 seconds or so this instruction will not hold so every time an otp will accompany it and that will be valid only for few seconds after that it will become invalid so this is this is basically the idea to prevent any kind of replay attack so uh, you of course my might have heard must have heard this term otp also n ones right n ones is number used once right so basically otp is an instance of n ones right so they are used to um, uh, pre prevent replay kind of attacks the fourth form of attack or threat against integrity is repudiation repudiation means denying so you have made a payment to your vendor and tomorrow the vendor denies that you have made the payment he says that no i have not received your payment so what do we keep we keep the transaction id so that he cannot deny also it might happen that you have paid uh, 
you have uh, instructed your friend on something and tomorrow you deny that no you have done it at your own risk i never instructed you that is also not desirable so he, your friend will also keep a proof that this instruction was actually given by so and so party right so repudiation or denying might happen at both the receiver's end and sender's end again this relates to source authentication such as in masquerading somebody who is acting as you illegitimately and um, using some information uh, to prevent that you need source authentication similarly when some instruction is given or some information is exchanged the source authentication is uh, equally important to prevent repudiation so both these relate to source authentication replaying you mainly uh, achieve through otp and n ones modification detection you do through message digests hashes watermarks etc right so these are forms of threat to integrity threat to availability denial of service like i told you thousands of bogus messages sent to the server within few seconds so the server will go down its capacity will come down and it won't be able to serve the actual users it will deny service to actual users the actual users will demand for uh, their service and the server will deny it right so that is threat to availability denial of service happened because uh, thousands of bogus messages had come to the server right so um, these are basically the classes of attacks against our three goals of security and if you have noticed these two forms these forms of attacks threats against confidentiality are passive so the attacker will sit idly will not do anything actively just snoop the channel read and observe do nothing actively whereas these kinds of uh, threats like modification masquerading replay repudiation denial of service they involve some active participation by the attacker now you might think that these are actively the attacker is doing something so these are more risky actually possibly it is the reverse right because passive observation you have no way to detect you can only prevent it later on you if a person has read your message you cannot do about anything about it right so these are actually more dangerous you have to take precautionary measures active participation you can do something towards it later on right <clears throat> so here is the categorization passive versus active attacks right so these we have discussed given this now i shall move on to a much newer branch of security digital forensics so till now what we have talked about these are traditional security um, challenges and measures since the very olden days these have been in place now very recently maybe over the last uh, couple of decades or so the focus has shifted i won't say shifted but added to a new domain of security whereby uh, the uh, idea or the concern is that if there has been a crime already what can you do about it in spite of enforcing all the measures to preserve confidentiality integrity and availability a crime has taken place a cyber crime has taken place then what would you do the term forensics comes into the picture you might uh, already know that the police department they have a forensic branch what is their role there has been a crime and now this team the forensic team goes there analyzes the crime scene they just put a, a border do not cross this border uh, so they will demarcate the area 
and would not let anybody in. Why? So that the evidences are not tampered with. They are not lost or tampered in any way. So the basic motto of these forensic analysts or these forensic investigators is to um, analyze the leftover evidences to find out the crime source, to catch the culprit and prove his guilt, right? So this is all about taking measures after something bad has already happened. Whereas the traditional concern, the traditional uh, um, um, uh, branch of security, it dealt more with what can we do beforehand. Assuming that something bad might happen, what can we do beforehand? Right. So if there is a chance that some outsider might snoop your channel, you would encrypt your message. If there is a chance that some outsider might modify your message, you would already incorporate an algorithm at both the ends to detect this modification. But what if you have not taken any measures or whatever measures you took has failed and the crime has taken place, the attack has already been delivered, can we do something about it? Are there any traces which are left behind by the attacker or the criminal? If yes, try to find it. If you have found it, try to exploit it, use it and analyze and use it to detect the criminal. Or at least to gather some information about the criminal, the source of crime, right? That is the whole idea. and this entire idea gives birth to this much newer branch of security called digital forensics. It is completely different than the old and traditional branch of security, which are equally important in today's date. But this newer concern is also there. So this is a add on to the already existing techniques, right? So forensic science is Techniques involving collection, preservation, and analysis of evidences collected from a crime scene. It's the branch of forensic science. Digital forensics is the branch of forensic science which deals with investigation of cyber crime. So we are not going to talk about physical forensics, the stuff which the police department deals with. We are not going to talk about that. Rather, we are going to talk more about cyber crime. Now, of course, the police department, they do have a cell which um, uh, work with cyber criminals and they, they uh, are dealing with cyber crimes. So that is what we are going to talk about, digital forensics. So forensics as a whole analyzes evidences left behind after the crime has happened. And digital forensics in particular it deals with analysis of evidences left behind in the digital devices. So let me talk about few problems as I have already given you the outline, the four problems, and then this will get even clearer. So this slide basically summarizes the idea of uh, um, traditional security measures vis-a-vis -vis forensic measures, the newer measures. So this slide is all about uh, your traditional security measures. I have shown two mm, different techniques, security techniques, which probably most of us might have used, like digital watermarking. Knowingly or unknowingly, we have used digital watermarking. How when you are using a, a digital point and shoot camera, or a DSLR, whatever you are using, or your mobile cameras also nowadays, you have the option of incorporating a digital watermark to it. So, so people who do photography, they would have their own watermarks just to identify that this photograph has been captured by this particular photographer, nobody else. So it's all about preserving the integrity and the identification of the uh, user, right? So you can see the, the, that is that is what is digital watermarking all about. You can see on this slide here what what do they do basically? There is this sensitive file, for example, your photograph. 
So what you do is you generate a watermark. And this watermark is basically a function of the sensitive file. You embed it into the sensitive file. You can see the watermark is embedded into the file. Right. You can see the watermark is embedded into the file. So after embedding, what you have is the file embedded with the watermark or simply the watermark file. This watermark file is now sent to your receiver. Or it, it's not only about sending to a particular user. It is also about releasing it or sharing it over social networks. So it goes out. It goes there. Right. Uh, to the public domain. It's basically that. So we call it the insecure channel. Whether you are posting it on your social media uh, platform or you are mailing it uh, or transmitting it over the internet, whatever it is, it is basically the idea is that it's getting transmitted or um, leaked to the insecure domain, the public domain, right? The file has been received. A lot of people are viewing the photograph. Or if it is a message exchange, the receiver is just having a look at the uh, photograph. What now the target next target is what authenticating. OK, is it the actual photography I, I am I am targeting to uh, use or view or buy the photograph by this particular uh, photographer? So is it the actual authentic photography? What do you do for that? This is the post processing part. See. In the post-processing part, uh, the received from this received file, you extract the watermark. That's the embedded data. Sorry, you extract the watermark and you extract the file, right? After removing the watermark, and then you authenticate matching these two. If there is a match, then it is authentic. If they do not match, it is non-authentic, right? So this is post-processing. Steganograph, this is the pre-processing part. Embedding and extracting is the post-processing part. Another example is steganography. Now, it's just kind of reverse of watermarking. In steganography, what we do, the sensitive information is hidden into a cover file. You might have seen there is this uh, picture and within this picture, some hidden codes are embedded. Within this Mona Lisa picture, you, there are some codes which are embedded. If you extract the pixels, you read the least significant uh, bits, you might find some hidden data. So in watermarking, the, the file that you are trying to protect is the bigger file into which you are wa embedding the watermark. In steganography, it's just the reverse. The bigger file or the bigger picture, the cover file basically, that's not what you are aiming to protect or hide. What you are hiding is embedded into the bigger file. Right. So we say the cover file within which you embed the sensitive data. Right. And here the watermark is embedded into the sensitive cover file. So you have the Stigo file. Again, it is transmitted over the insecure channel. The hidden data is extracted. And after extracting the hidden data, you have the original file. So whatever it is, both these are traditional security techniques, right? Both these involve some kind of pre-processing. As I was telling you, what will happen if you have not watermarked your file, if you did not take any such pre-processing or precautionary measure, and you have simply released your file to the uh, public domain, and then somebody has exploited your data. Isn't there any way to do something about it? Yes, there is. And the answer is provided by digital forensics. You can see if you compare it with the scenario on this slide. On the digital forensics slide, you can see the file is there as it is. No precautionary measures taken, no pre-processing steps involved. It's directly being transmitted over the channel. And now possibly it has been forced. It's forced or not can be told. If it is forced, the source of forgery can be told to you all through forensic analysis.
so this is 100% post processing based analysis no pre processing 100% post processing and the output is identification of forgery right so it's 100% post processing based analysis right digital forensics is 100% post processing based analysis <clears throat> on this slide you can see a snapshot of a newspaper this snapshot i have collected from this particular paper you can go and you can read this paper it was published in 2003 right so this photo this top photo this is the altered image how this image was generated it, this is a fictitious meeting this depicts this photo depicts a fictitious meeting between president clinton and saddam hussein so this is a artificially generated photograph so natural looking Uh, which was out there in the media some time back how this how was this image generated this this event never happened and there was this image there was this photograph how it is an instance of a doctored image right c photograph 1 photograph 2 you can see this this part has been copied from here this object copied from here and the background has been copied from this particular image so intelligently three different images have been combined to generate this doctored image now if some kind of attack is there like this what pre processing uh, measure will you rely on there is nothing you can rely on you have to rely on post processing based forensic analysis once this kind of attacks uh started becoming prevalent the research fo focus automatically shifted to digital forensics or forensic analysis and now uh, to in today's date we have very efficient take very accurate techniques by which very accurate algorithms to which if you feed this kind of a doctored image it immediately identifies that the three objects background object a and object b they have been uh, put together from three different sources there are ways by which you do it mainly based on analysis of image statistics there are various ways but what is important is now we have accurate techniques to identify that different portions of this image have been brought uh, from different external sources and this is a doctored this is not a natural image this is a computer generated image you might have this this term is very popular nowadays cgi computer generated imagery right so they say that this image is computer generated it's a doctored image right so this is uh, this is the very first problem of doctored image detection which forensic analysts deal with right here is another one example artificial compositing of images you can see there are different uh, one two and three three different images they have been combined and uh, this image is formed this is the output right and this this techniques are always not done with malicious intention you um, already know that these techniques are very uh, common in the film industry they use this for editing and finally um, uh, cgi techniques they apply to generate their frames right so it's not always with malicious intention 
but then it is important to have techniques which will identify these kind of videos that whether they are artificial or they are naturally captured the second problem so here is so this was the first problem doctored image detection we many times called it compositing attack right uh, compositing attack or splicing attack many times we call it splicing attack uh, or doctored doctored image compositing splicing or doctored image generation three different terms are there all these three refer to the same attack against security this is uh, so that was the first form of forensic uh, problems that uh, people have addressed till now and still working on the second class of problems uh, which has drawn significant uh, research attention in the field of digital forensics is the copy move forgery attack this diagram is self explanatory you can see this particular image this was the authentic image right this is authentic image and this is the forged image can you detect what's the difference you can see that this object has been forged and pasted here how this was obtained this was obtained from this image itself i told you if your forgery is something like this then the natural statistics of these portions of the image are studied and analyzed and the algorithm will find out that the statistical properties differ in these three objects and they conclude that this portion this portion and the background have been obtained from three different sources but what if the forged portion say this particular object has been obtained from the same image the statistical properties would match and the detection becomes even more tough right so here mm, you see this is a missile which has been uh, released and uh, it's copied from either one of these three and some intelligent post processing has been applied like this tail portion it has been blurred you can see the entire brightness and contrast of this object has been adjusted somewhat it appears as if a new missile is being fired it's actually not this image has been intelligently manipulated so this is the copy move forgery many times called the region duplication forgery so what we do here is some regions of the image are duplicated so it might be with the target of repeating some objects or it might be with the target of obscuring some object for example this object you can see this is uh, again the image source is um, this paper the same paper which was published in 2003 so you can go back and have a look at this paper it is uh, very interesting so what this image shows is that uh, in some forest possibly uh, this image has been captured from a helicopter or with a drone camera and it shows you some very dense foliage within a forest two militant trucks were stuck there right and this image before being produced uh, for analysis what the person did is that copied a portion from this image possibly from here this dense foliage was copied and simply pasted to this region so as to hide this second truck now it appears as if only this truck was there 
only a single truck was there. It would look very, very natural, number one. Second, those techniques which identified composited images would also fail here. Why? Because uh, the statistics, the properties, image features will match. Right. So copy move forgery detection becomes even more challenging. And you can see since the last decade, uh, last 10 years, people have started working in this field. But still, if anybody is interested, there are a lot of open problems here. And you can explore all those. Right. It's also called cloning attack many times. So uh, I will not go into the solutions which are there to uh, prevent or address copy move forgery kind of attack or for that matter any other forms of attacks in this particular lecture we are going to discuss about the open problems uh, but just to give you an idea basically what we do is uh, in this this form of forgery we investigate the different uh, statistical features of different portions of the image and we try to find a mismatch whereas here we identify different small blocks of the image like this pixel sub matrices and we try to match all the pairs right whenever we see that uh, a particular neighborhood of blocks particular set of neighboring blocks matches with another set of equal size neighboring blocks then we um, with high probability we can ascertain that probably these two regions have been copied we don't know which one is authentic and which one is forced but we at least know that there has been a copy move forgery right so that is the whole idea uh, it's basically exhaustive search or correlation based search right exact matching robust matching these these are the techniques which uh, target to find out region duplication attack. The idea for all these are basically divide the image into blocks and try to find out matching neighborhood of these blocks. The third form of attack is format specific forensic investigation. Right, so let me just have a look at how much time do I have? Okay. Up till uh, 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, okay, okay, thank you. So the third form of attack is format specific attacks. Now, we all know that when we are using a digital camera, uh, or a mobile phone camera or a DSLR, whatever you are using, what is the storage format? The storage format possibly is JPEG, right? Joint Photography Experts Group, JPEG, right? So this format is uh, probably the most common of all the storage formats used. Why? Because of its uh, high degrees of compression. So you, what do you want? You want to capture a lot of photographs, a lot of images, snaps, and to hold as much as possible in your device, right? JPEG provides you very good degrees of compression, minimizes the storage, and optimizes the quality, right? With max best quality, it will give you least storage requirement. Uh, uh, so the JPEG algorithm is so powerful. That is why JPEG is most preferred format for image storage. Now, with all these good things about JPEG, the bad people, the attackers, again have devised some ways to attack images or forge images which are stored in JPEG format. Right. And we, the forensic analysts, also have succeeded to again exploit the characteristics of JPEG algorithm to find out this kind of forgeries. 
in this slide you can see such an instance so here is a jpeg image and um, you might have already guessed that when we are talking about a jpeg image or any compressed image as such the fact is that there is a certain compression quality or a certain uh, quantization factor right so if the quantization factor is very high that means the compression is very high the size as well as the quality is reduced if the quantization factor is low or the size is uh, or the quality factor is low that means uh, it is close to zero so it's good now when jpeg image you are storing you are generating and storing on your device it is stored in certain quality factor normally the quality factor that uh, is used in all the devices is around 60 to 80 right it's on the scale of 0 to 100 so whatever it is let us say this was your given image with quality factor let's say qf1 now a portion of this image you can see has been extracted and some manipulations have been done now i have not for just for a depiction purpose i have not modified anything but the attacker will of course modify something for example scanned image of your uh, passport or other card the attacker has used uh, you had provided to uh, a shop for buying a sim and later on that was that scanned copy was somehow misused by the shopkeeper and some illegitimate party let us say a terrorist has come into the country and used your card how tampering some of the fields field values and if you have followed recent news this kind of things have happened a lot right so anyway so kyc document verification and authentication uh, happens to be a very challenging task even today given the fact that how uh, widely used these are the scanned copies of your kyc documents you provide uh, to the shopkeeper to buy sim cards right and uh, this this can be misused at any later point of time so we need to be careful about all these things. Anyway, we were talking about uh, digital forensics. So I shall stick to that topic. And uh, 